EMS uh, trauma grand rounds. Today we're going to talk, speak uh, on chest trauma and Casey Thompson from Air Med is going to speak uh, on chest trauma and uh, she's been with Air Med for a while. She can talk about that. She has many certifications. She's almost finished with her master's degree and which she's happy for <laughs> and she's got lots of experience and she's a great talker. Thank you. Thanks Ross. So I wish you guys were here because I have an arena full. I have 1,000, over 1,000 people here watching me right now. Okay, actually like five, but. <laughs> so this is the first time I've done grand rounds before or trauma rounds, so not having an audience to kind of talk to is a little unnerving. So I expect a lot out of you five, even you Robert in the back. <laughs> So, um, like Russ said, I've been with AirMed for about five years, and before I moved to Utah, I actually was living in Florida, a little bit different flying in Florida. No mountains, basically the Epcot ball is the biggest thing we had to watch out for, so a little bit different. And with the altitude that we have here in Utah, it was a really big lesson for me to learn all about the gas laws and how it affects chest trauma in particular. So the good news about chest trauma is it hasn't really changed. Nobody's really coming up with new diagnoses. Everything that we've known for 50 years is still the same. So hopefully we can talk a couple things today that um, you can kind of expound on in your own practice, maybe even assessment skills. And I think the one thing that after each flight I do is I kind of, with my partner, debrief the flight, what could we have done better? And the main thing that I'm coming up with every scene flight I do is I need to do a better assessment, and that includes the chest. We're kind of um, against the time clock. We need to be off the scene within 10 minutes. So I have to kind of couple a very quick trauma assessment with a good trauma assessment. And that's always the one thing I can improve on. So hopefully we can talk a few things today and, and get you guys to also improve your assessment skills as well. All right, so chest trauma, second leading cause of death. And this is only second to spinal cord trauma, brain trauma. The brain always wins between the heart and the brain. Um, war the, between the neuro nurses and the cardiac nurses. Any, when you look at traumatic deaths, 25% of those are chest trauma related. And then you take that one step further. 50% of your patients that come into the ER with respiratory distress when they finally do need to get intubated, 50% of them die. That's a huge, huge mortality rate. And then you couple that with shock. So if you have shock, chest trauma, and respiratory failure, respiratory distress, 75% of your patients are going to die. So chest trauma comes in many forms. Sometimes the patients do it to themselves. So this guy definitely is classified as chest trauma because his chest is on the other side of the freeway. And sometimes we do chest trauma to our patients to try to make them better. So this is a thoracotomy, and it sounds like there was a thoracotomy lecture not too long ago. And for you guys out of, out of town, if you do drive your patients down to the university, if they're even talking thoracotomy in the ER, if your patient does have a cardiac arrest and has chest trauma, they will do a thoracotomy in the ER. It is an amazing, amazing experience. And if you guys could just stick around a little bit longer and watch this, you will learn so, so much. Our trauma service here in our trauma program is amazing. So when you're bringing your patients in after your long haul, grab a Starbucks and um, at least kind of take a look and see what's going on in the trauma bay. So just to review for anatomy, lots of stuff going on between your neck and your abdomen. And it's a pretty vulnerable area, and there's lots of important things in this area. So you've got all your skeletal structures, your lungs, your tracheobronchial tree, your diaphragm, and then your great vessels. And when we talk about great vessels, we're talking about superior, inferior vena cavas, your aorta, and then your pulmonary artery. Once you have trauma to any of those, um, got to get to an OR quick in order to save a life. So when I was putting this together for you guys, I was kind of thinking of when I am transporting patients with traumatic injuries to the chest and what I think of. And the number one issue that I see with chest injuries is hypoxia. So hypoxia can come in many different forms. So hypovolemia, you don't have your hemoglobin to carry the oxygen um, all around because you've got a hole in your chest that's spewing blood out left and right. Failure to ventilate the lungs, so your rib fractures, your flail chests, those patients don't want to take a deep breath. They're not getting oxygen down deep into their lungs. And pressure changes in the interpleural space. We take patients from 5,000 feet, um, like maybe invernal. We fly them over the Uinas at 12,000 feet. Those pressure changes can cause havoc within the chest cavity. 
The other thing we see is hypercarbia, so high CO2s in the blood. And those patients will have decreased level of consciousness. So we get on scene and the patient's breathing six times a minute. We intubate them and our opening CO2s are 60, 70, 80 because they're not wanting to take deep breaths and obviously haven't been taking deep breaths. So next, impairments to cardiac output. So cardiac output, stroke volume times heart rate. So when you have a hole in the chest and blood is spewing everywhere, we are gonna have a decrease in the volume that's circulating. So when you have a decrease in the blood volume, your stroke volume has decreased. In order for your body to compensate for that, your heart rate's gonna shoot up. So we can have issues with cardiac output with blood loss, intrapleural pressures, uh, pericardial tamponades. So your pericardial sac is filled with fluid, your heart is not pumping effectively, therefore your cardiac output's in the toilet. So in issues with ventilatory efficiency, these patients, once again, not wanting to take a deep breath. With their rib fractures, with their flail chest, you can't get them to take a deep breath. And also uh, hemothoraxes, these can cause issues with ventilation. And then gas exchange. I keep harping on this and we're gonna talk about rib fractures. These patients don't wanna take a deep breath. They get atelectatic within their lungs. Uh, pulmonary contusions makes them not want to take a deep breath as well. So you guys get on scene. On your initial survey, you're going to go ahead and anything life-threatening. If, if there's a hole, plug it. If it needs to have pressure applied, put pressure on your hole. Next, we're going to look at potentially life-threatening injuries, and then you can go ahead and get your assessment done. If you guys do interfacility transports, I think the one thing to think about is when you get there, if your gut feeling is telling you to intubate that patient, go ahead and talk to the ER doctor. Get them to RSI the patient. So many times uh, we'll have hospitals that wait for us to get there in order to intubate the patient. And by that point, you know, the patient's definitely decompensated and sick. My rule of thumb is if I think about it twice, two separate occasions, then we're going to do whatever it is I'm thinking of. All right, chest. I want you guys to really think about your chest um, trauma survey when you're doing it. So take a look. When I get on scene and the clothes are completely on the patient, that's a problem. You're not taking a look. You're not being able to palpate. So cut all the clothes off the patient. You can put a blanket on them once you're done so they're not you know, flapping in the wind. And also take a good listen to them. I was just on scene last week with Tawilla, and they had an electric stethoscope. Have you guys seen those? They are wild. Um, it's a speaker in the stethoscope, and you can listen. And more interestingly, uh, I went to an oral surgeon yesterday. to get, i got to get my wisdom teeth out, so I'm asking him all about this conscious sedation. He has a Bluetooth that goes into his ear that it has your respiratory rate and your breath sounds in his ear the entire time. Crazy. So shout out to my Tawilla homies that have the electronic stethoscope, first one I've seen. So with palpation, I want you to get in there. I'm not talking just a quick little looking over. I'm talking feel, push, push on the sternum, push on the ribs, get into their axillas. That is where your subcutaneous air is going to hide, right up in your armpit. So feel all around. And the respiratory rate, are they having shallow respirations? Are they breathing at all? And history, take a quick moment before you leave that scene to see if there's any bystanders that know what happened. And this is the one thing that I think everybody in EMS can improve on. And I get this question a lot from my providers in the Valley, is what can we do better to make your job a little bit easier? And I love that you guys want to make my life easy. That makes me very happy. But the one thing is when I get into the back of the ambulance, so often everybody just starts telling me all about the injuries. We've got an open femur. We've got um, a, a chest contusion. We've got bleeding from this, this orifice. Take 15 seconds and get me a really good report. The patient was a driver, had a seat belt, did not have airbag deployment, positive of LOC and then you can spew what's going on with the patient. I know that you've probably told your LZ commander what the issue was and the LZ commander probably told my dispatch what the issue was. We don't ever get any of that information. So just take a quick 15 seconds when we get on scene and give us a good, good report. Mechanism of injury. And with smartphones now, we can take pictures super easy. It takes two seconds. I love taking pictures of the cars on scene. When I get to the trauma bay, I say, hey, Dr. Vargo, take a look at this car. I know that this patient doesn't look like he's super sick, but there was an echo in the seat next to him, and this is what the car looked like. And also along the lines of mechanism is as you're taking, when you guys are driving up on scene, or for me when I'm flying over the scene, it really can answer a lot of questions. So if it's a frontal impact, I'm going to worry about the steering column in this guy chest, so uh, myocardial contusions, sternal fractures, my first or second rib fractures. If there was lateral impact, who was the person sitting on the side where the uh, main impact came? 
This is actually a scene up on I-80 with North Summit. And as we're flying overhead, this is what we're seeing. And this guy had terrible, terrible chest injuries. Um, and we actually did not transport him. He had actually, nobody was able to call 911 for a while. And when we got there, it had been about an hour so uh, since the incident happened. So sad. So chest trauma, two different kinds. We've got blunt and we've got penetrating. The bad news is, is the blunt's more common, and it's definitely the less sexy of the two. Blunt traumas are, you know, people kind of like, ugh. But 70% of our traumas are blunt trauma, so we've got to be familiar with them. Four different kinds of blunt trauma. You've got your soft tissue injuries, your orthopedic injuries. So all those bones we talked about definitely can be fractured. They're causing chest trauma. And pulmonary issues, pulmonary contusions, pneumothoraces. And then your cardiac, your heart sits right beneath your sternum. If your sternum's fractured, probably have a myocardial contusion as well. So the sexy of the traumas is penetrating trauma, my favorite, and I'm sure your favorite too. You hear you're going on a penetrating trauma and everybody's so excited. Uh, main thing that we see are knife and firearms. If it is a knife, leave it in. Don't, don't take it out. Don't wiggle it around. If it is a gunshot wound, just tell me what kind of gun, what kind of bullet. And I know there's a lot of fancy bullets out there that I may not be familiar with. So that's the one thing I will be writing down is the type of bullet. Was it self-inflicted? Is there somebody on the run that has this gun that's a crazy person? And then um, the distance. So did they get shot from 50 feet away with a 50 caliber gun? Um, that probably might be a non-transport. But the one thing I want to caution you about firearms is not to chart entrance and exit wound because that can come back to bite you when you go to court, if you go to court. So if, you, if it's a self-inflicted gunshot wound, sure, we can assume that this was the entrance in the um, anterior and the posterior was the exit. But please don't document that because when you go to court, they're going to say, well, you documented this as the entrance wound when in fact he had gotten shot from the back. So just something to think about with your charting. Rib fractures, kind of touched on this a little bit, and I think rib fractures don't get enough respect. Oh, go ahead, Russell. One of the things, too, you talk about blunt trauma. Uh, when they're, if they're in a cardiac arrest, uh, the important thing to remember is blunt trauma is 99.9% fatal. Uh, if you're out in the field and you, you got somebody in there uh, in blunt trauma, they're not going to survive unless you can you know, put the needles in and stuff like that uh, to relieve attention tension or something of that nature. Absolutely correct. Uh, whereas penetrating is a much higher survivability. And so the sexy of the two traumas are the ones that we get to transport more because the blunt traumas may be dead on scene. Yeah. And I think Russ is feeling bad for me, you guys. I told him that I feel like I don't have any interaction with you out there all the way in Montana or Iowa, wherever you are. So he's feeling bad for me and he's actually participating. So thank you, Russ, for making me feel better. No, I, I stick my nose in there. <laughs> and I told Russ too, the other thing is I learn a lot from the people I teach. So even if it's basic EMTs, they usually teach me something about assessment skills or something that they've, they've had. So um, you guys all have to teach me something before I leave today which I got brilliant people in the room. That won't be easy, or won't be hard. So how many CCs? How many CCs does it uh, take to cause cardiac tamponade? Oh, not, not, a, not a lot, especially if it is a quick cardiac tamponade trauma-related. 20, 5, 10. 5, 5 to 7 CCs. See, look, now you guys, we all learned something today. <laughs> Thank you, Russ. You're, you're checked off, Janet, Sharon. <laughs> you guys still are, you got your work cut out for you. So rib fracture, most common chest injury that we see. And I think rib fractures don't get a ton of respect. People just go, oh, he's just got a rib fracture. If you've never had a rib fracture, believe me, you don't want one. They hurt like hell. So we need to give these patients lots of pain medicine. If you've got rib fractures, right underneath your ribs are your lungs. So pay attention to maybe lung contusions, lung injuries. 10% of the traumatic injuries that we see with chest trauma will have rib fractures. And then more common in adults than children. So a couple different reasons why. Um, our elderly people, they don't have a ton of calcium in their bones. Their bones are brittle. They will fracture very easily. Our kids are soft and pliable. They're like sponges, you know. I've been on scenes with ATVs and automobiles running over children, even on their chest. They've got a huge tire mark, and the chest x-ray has no fractures whatsoever. They are just really, really like spring form mattresses almost. So check out these mortality rates. This was pretty interesting when I was doing the research for this. So 5% mortality with one to two rib fractures, which doesn't sound like a lot unless it's you. If I was walking around with a 5% mortality, I'd be pretty scared. And then you add seven or more, 30% mortality rate. 
So then another thing to think about, if you take a 21-year-old and a 75-year-old and give them the same exact chest trauma, chest injuries, they've got double the mortality. So chest, um, chest trauma with rib fractures is nothing to mess around, especially with our older people. And our ribs form rings around. So if you're fractured in the front, you could be fractured in the back. So just pay attention to kind of listening, looking at the chest film and coming up with whatever you can. And when I say coming up with whatever you can, talk to the doctor or the nurse practitioner that's there. They are great, great teachers. So if you guys can hang around for the chest film to come up, it's great, especially at the U. We get like the swarm of people, and that's when I learn a ton because we've got the residents that are learning as well. So here's some rib fractures on this side of the chest film. So first and second rib, super hard to break the first and the second rib. And I can throw the clavicle in as well. These bones are thick, they're dense, and they're very difficult to break. If you know that you have a first or a second rib fracture, you need to start thinking of something else. There may be something else going on. Super hard, hard to break, and they hurt terribly, terribly, terribly. Underneath those first and second ribs, we've got an aorta and a bronchus to worry about. If you've got a lacerated aorta, you'll know pretty quick because your patient's going to tell you, like, Adios, see you on the other side. So 30% of patients with first and second rib fractures will die. And take a look for pneumothoraxes, pneumothoraces, and then your subclavian artery sits right underneath there. So pay attention, if they've got a lot of swelling, it's pretty interesting to see when you have a subclavian issue. But the good news is the most commonly fractured ribs are the fifth through the ninth. So that's good news because you don't have to worry about the aorta or the bronchus all the way down there. So 8th to 12th rib, when you think about these ribs, think about the underlying solid organs. So we've got the liver on the right side, we've got the spleen on the left, and then you've got your kidneys on either side. So if you know that you are having fractures of these ribs, kind of start thinking, okay, maybe we've got some solid organ damage, which if you've got a liver or a, splen a splenic laceration, lots of fluid. Those patients need big IVs and lots of fluid. So signs and symptoms. These patients do not want to take a deep breath. So how can we help them? Pain medicine. Lots and lots of pain medicine. Um, the last severe chest trauma I did was probably a couple months ago, and it was at altitude. And it was a lady, her stats were like 85%, and EMS told us, hey, you, you're probably going to have to intubate her. So we get into the, the back of the ambulance, and she's kind of just really shallow breathing. She did not want to take a deep breath. So 85% on a non-rebreather, and my partner and I are kind of talking about it. We gave her um, some fentanyl, a little slug of Versed, and some ketamine, and she was the best deep breather I've ever met in my life. She was happy as a clam, so I made a new best friend that day. And secondly, she brought her stats up to 96%. We didn't need to intubate her at all. So the splinted respirations, you can help with pain medicine. They're going to have a ton of pain, maybe chest wall instability, bony crepitus. And what I mean by that is as you feel over the bones, you can feel little Rice Krispies. And then bruising. So how do we manage rib fractures? And hopefully by now you're going to realize that I am the crazy lady that talks nothing about, I just, I'm a pain medicine freak. And that's because I think we've got enough pharmacolog pharmacological agents with us to make our patients not be in pain. And I understand that most of you guys out there work under protocols, so you can only do as much as your protocol says. But two milligrams of morphine for rib fractures is not enough. So if you carry fentanyl, that's a great choice. Um, we're lucky enough to carry ketamine, and ketamine is such a good choice for these patients. So if I do see you guys on a scene, it's totally fine if you say, hey, I need you to um, or call me the crazy lady that talks nothing but pain medicine. You know, that's me. I will definitely harp on pain medicine, harp on pain medicine. Are you going to teach me something, Janet? No. <laughs> Dang, I thought it was your turn. <laughs> <laughs> so lots of oxygen on these patients. They should be on non-rebreathers. If you need to intubate them, great, go for it. Encourage your patient to deep breathe, which I think a lot of nurses think is the ICU nurse's responsibility, and it's not. We need to make sure that we're encouraging our patients to take deep breaths on the transport. And then we complicate rib fractures with elderly patients, with patients with pre-existing lung issues, so lung cancer, COPD, emphysema. The other thing that complicates rib fractures are obese people. The obesification of America right now is insane. The majority of the patients I transport are obese. These patients don't take deep breaths on a good day. So how do we expect them to take deep breaths with rib fractures? 
So the sexy part of rib fractures is flail chest. So we've all read this definition. Two rib fractures in two or more places of neighboring ribs. So they have to be adjacent, and they're broken in two or more spots. The cool thing about uh, flail chest is, in theory, you should see um, a chest wall instability, so like a free-floating segment. The bad thing is, is that some patients don't have that free-floating segment early because they've got intercostal muscles that are spasming, and they're actually holding that segment in place. So if you're relying on just looking at that, you may not see it, especially early. Usually secondary to um, blunt trauma. So uh, our patients that are underneath a car and the car dro drops on them or uh, steering wheel to the chest, these are the patients you see flail chest with. More common in older patients, and we talked about that. And the incidence is 10 to 15% with major, major chest trauma. So signs and symptoms, these patients will have the paradoxical movement, maybe. This is one of the most underutilized tools that I think EMS and nurses <coughs> don't use, and it's free. Look at your patient's chest rise and your chest fall. And I don't mean like sitting on the side of the patient and kind of eyeballing. Get behind your patient behind the head of the bed, get down to eye level, take their shirt off, take the blanket off, and look at chest rise. And it took me a while to appreciate this assessment skill because in the helicopter we can't listen. Maybe with this electronic stethoscope we can. But if you take a look and you can kind of see one chest is coming up and the other chest is kind of being lagging behind, something's going on. And I think if we could just constantly be reassessing that every 15 minutes on these long transports, it would help us tremendously. So look for contusions, which sometimes might be a later sign. Respiratory distress, all these patients are short of breath. All these patients have pleuritic chest pain. They don't want to take a deep breath because of the, they want to splint that side. If you give them a towel roll or a pillow, sometimes that helps as well. And you may feel crepitus on top of the bone, little Rice Krispies. All of our trauma patients are short of breath, which makes them hypoxic. So here's the chest film just blown up a little bit. So this is rib number three four, five, and six. Oh, here we go. Sorry, five, six. And you can see all these fractures here. So ramifications of a flail chest. Lots of pain. These patients, their ventilation is terrible. They are short of breath, so their work of breathing is increased. And those respirations that they're doing are so shallow, the tidal volumes are so small, that they are not getting good oxygen saturation deep down in their alveoli. So what are we going to do? Give them pain medicine. The crazy lady on the telehealth thing told us to do pain medicine. Lots and lots of pain medicine. If you need to get an airway in these people, and if, if the accident was four hours ago and it was a search and assist and we're going out to find these patients, they're definitely going to need airway assistance. Suspecting spinal injuries, they should all be on a backboard with a collar. If you do intubate these people, a bag valve mask with a peep valve on the end of them. Our Ambu bags that we carry have a peep valve, and I don't know if a lot of the agencies carry peep valves or not, but it is a great adjunct to help get these patients not get atelectatic while they're in the hospital. You can stabilize that chest wall with, you know, the old school with sandbags. We don't carry sandbags. Towel rolls if you can. Uh, IV monitor and get them to wherever they need to go. So we talked about PEEP. So on every single test we all take, we know what PEEP stands for, positive end expiratory pressure. But what does it actually mean in theory? So this is a great video. This is a set of rabbit lungs, and this is not what I did last night in my spare time, I promise. Uh, <laughs> but what we're going to do is as the video starts, there's five of PEEP on the lungs. So there's five of PEEP. And now he's actually going to put on ten of PEEP. <clears throat> and now the cute rabbit's going to get 15 of peep. And you can see every little last alveoli is popping open. This is such a great illustration to show you exactly what peep does. We always talk about it in theory, but here's real life right here. And now you're going to see he's going to take the peep valve off. Now. There we go. So I talk about PEEP, and it's a great tool. However, there are some side effects in patients that should not get PEEP. So when I think of patients that shouldn't get PEEP, I have to go back to the pathophysiology. And looking at this illustration, it, makes it, it just makes sense to me, which I love it when stuff makes sense, because a lot of stuff in my life just does not make sense. <laughs> this is one of those things that, that will, though. So as you're putting that PEEP on, you saw with 15 of PEEP, those lungs are huge. Your thoracic cavity is not very big. So when you're pumping somebody's lungs up with 15 of PEEP, you're increasing the pressure in their 
chest. As you increase the pressure in their chest, venous return coming back to the right atrium is decreased. So as you decrease venous return, you're de decreasing cardiac output. So the patient that does not need PEEP are your patients with low blood pressure. So if, you're, if I'm on a scene and my patient's pressure is 70 over 40 and somebody says, hey, how about PEEP? I'm going to go, no, we're, that would decrease venous return and then make their blood pressure even lower. Um, another patient population I can think of that would not benefit from PEEP are your status asthmaticus because those patients are auto-PEEPing as it is and the last thing they need is more PEEP. Sternum fractures. So here's actually just some um, images. You can kind of see the fracture there and then the fracture there. Sternum fractures are really, really hard to do. So you should think of yourself lucky if you can get a sternum fracture because the chances of that is 5 to 8%. So if you get a sternum fracture, you're definitely um, in the smaller part of the population. The bad part about sternal fractures is they hurt terribly, terribly bad. Usually blunt force trauma to the chest, a steering wheel to the chest. The last time I saw a sternum fracture was out in Vernal. It was a 65-year-old guy that had an ATV roll on top of him and stay on top of him. And when I got there, he was in atrial fibrillation, and I said, oh, how long have you had AFib? And he said, God, everybody is asking me that. What, in the, what is AFib? And he actually had a change in rhythm from the sternum fracture, which, crushed, which gave him a myocardial contusion, and changed his rhythm. Associated with steering wheel injuries, patients that are working underneath trucks or cars and have the, the car kind of compress their sternum, that's how they get these sternal fractures. So pretty high mortality rate. If I had that mortality rate walking around, I would walk around with a helmet and protective gear 24-7. That's pretty, pretty high. With sternal fractures, you're going to get a myocardial contusion because your sternum is crushing your heart, which is crushing against your vertebral column. So it's kind of squishing everything in between, including your lungs. These patients can get pericardial tamponades, and you can also disrupt their aorta, which is a bad day for that patient. And tracheal bronchial tear. When we talk, we say tracheal bronchial tear, tracheal bronchial disruption, and what that is is as your trachea comes down and bifurcates into your bronchuses, bronchi, there's usually a tear in the trachea or the bronchus. And you will know this because these patients have air escaping and they get subcutaneous air building up. Also, be on the lookout for a flail chest. And now that you're so smart with flail chest, you're going to catch it like that. So findings with sternal fractures, these patients have a ton of pain. They're tender over the sternum. You're going to know they have a sternal fracture before the radiology images come back because when you're palpating on their sternum, they're going to scream their head off. And then you can say to the ER doc, hey, I am suspicious for a sternal fracture. You can feel crepitus. They're, they're tachypnic. They don't want to take a deep breath. And cardiac arrhythmias can ensue. So atrial fibrillation, PVC, VTAC. Okay. So if you're talking with that chronic arrhythmias and heart failure and with, oh yeah, sorry, <laughs> with pulmonary contusions, I mean, that's another one with fluid leak and stuff like that. I would assume that you have to be judicious with your IV fluids. I mean, you want to maintain pressure, but like that catch 22 situation. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And there's a lot on permissive hypotension, too, that it's actually okay to leave our patients at a map of 60 or 65. So if you are suspecting that with that leaking, that would be scary because their pressures are going to be low. Then you just kind of have to think, okay, can I live with the pressure of 80 over 60 and a map of 64? I can. I would be fine if that was my mom with that blood pressure. Really good point, Russ. Russ has two points, you guys. You better catch up. I was going to actually say that, but he's got the mic. <laughs> <laughs> so the management for sternal fractures is much the same of everything we talked about. The only thing different is if you're suspecting a sternal fracture, hook them up to a 12 lead and keep that 12 lead hooked up for your entire transport. And then you can just kind of take a look at it and see if there's been any changes. And get them to a trauma center. Or call me. I'll be happy to come get them. So pulmonary contusions, fancy word for bruising of the lung. These patients are usually high velocity. These are your ejections. These are steering wheel columns to the chest. These patients usually have rib fractures, sometimes a flail chest. 20 to 40% of these patients uh, that have rib fractures will have pulmonary contusions as well. Lots of hypoxia issues with these patients. They don't want to take a deep breath. Their SATs are low. Give them some pain medicine and they'll breathe for you. Interesting thing with pulmonary contusions is your alveoli actually can rupture, and when they rupture, they bleed, and that can kind of cause some edema, like Russ was saying, you get a fluid leak. Patients with pulmonary contusions sometimes will actually start coughing up blood, so that is a tip-off to go, oh gosh, something really bad is about to happen. 
Signs and symptoms, lots of pain. These patients will have some adventitious lung sounds. They're, they say they can't take a deep breath because their lungs feel stiff. They're tachycardic. They may be spitting up blood. They don't want to breathe. Lots of, con, um, lots of uh, chest wall contusions. And the x-ray will show some uh, opacity. And you can kind of see it right here and right and a little bit over here. When you're looking at a chest film for pulmonary contusion, sometimes it takes 24 to 48 hours to show up. So what that means for you, when you bring a patient in and they do a chest film and they say, holy cow, look at the pulmonary contusions that we can see, that tells you that they're pretty severe. Most pulmonary contusions that are minor, you pick up on CAT scan. So if you see them on the chest film, that's definitely a significant injury. And these patients' ABGs over the next two to three days are going to get worse and worse, and they may need to be intubated. Management of these patients is much of the same. Be aggressive with their airway if they have issues, COPD, emphysema, if they're obese, and getting them to a hospital ASAP. So pneumothorax, and I said like uh, chest trauma is timeless, it doesn't change. A pneumothorax is still a pneumothorax. It's a great review. Basically, air in the pleural space, you lose that negative pressure, and it interferes with the expansion of the lung. You can have a partial pneumothorax, and they actually can grade these as far as percentages go. So on CT scan, the radiologist will say 30% pneumo. Sometimes they say 5% pneumo, and you're like, oh, wow, thank you so much for being that astute. That's what you get paid the big bucks for. The one question I get a lot from ER physicians is when should I put a chest tube in if the patient has to fly in a helicopter? So we say, you know, in, in books, any, any books you read, 30 to 40 percent is kind of what they say. Now, the, the trouble with that is, is that not every patient is the same. Like I said, we've got a lot of obese patients. They may not do well with a 20 percent pneumo, taking them up to altitude. When I moved here from Florida five years ago, if I would have got a pneumo when I stepped off the plane, I would have been in a world of hurt because I'm living, I lived at 72 feet above sea level, so I would not do well. And then you need to think of especially our ski resort people. They come, they're flying in from sea level, they're drinking beer, they're up on the hill at 11,000 feet, they're getting a pneumo, they're not going to do well. So it really is patient specific. I don't have a good answer for you. If I had to give you an answer, 30 to 40 percent. So here's, anytime I look at chest films and I think of things very simply, if one side doesn't look like the other, there's a problem. So you can see right here, this patient has a pneumothorax, pretty significant. How do we get a pneumothorax? Blunt trauma to the chest, a knife to the chest, a gunshot wound. You can fracture a rib that pokes right into your lung. Some of these patients will spontaneously have a pneumo. Um, I would love to tell you that I have that problem because I'm so tall and so thin, but that's not the case. <laughs> Tall, thin men, for some reason, will just automatically sometimes get a pneumothorax. There are some disease processes out there that make you more vulnerable. Uh, Marfan syndrome. Abe Lincoln with the really long arms, he had Marfan syndrome. I'm sure he had a pneumothorax in his day as well. So those tall, thin people, such as myself, they exert themselves by exercising. They cough, and then they can just pop a pneumo. And we can cause pneumothorax on our patient by positive pressure ventilation. We're taking them from a negative pressure environment of them breathing on their own, putting a tube in their trachea, giving them positive pressure, and we can actually have them pop their own pneumo. Well, yeah, I mean, you think of those patients with, uh, that are uh, COPD or on steroids, mm. and that they thin out their lungs, and so then it's such a fragile tissue, the lung tissue, so it's easy to pop those. That's a and really good thought. That's a really good thought. I didn't even think about that with steroid use. So signs and symptoms. Decreased or absent breath sounds. And for us, we can't listen to lung sounds in the helicopter. I'm going to have to try that electronic stethoscope. That's what I'm going to spend my big fat paycheck on. There's one downstairs. There is? Yeah, down in that uh, whatever is positive you downstairs. Oh, good. After you give me this big paycheck for today, I'll yeah, go. That's right. <laughs> yeah, checks in the mail. Thanks. <laughs> These patients are going to say, it hurts when I take a deep breath, when, on, on inhalation more specifically. Difficulty breathing, these patients are breathing fast and they're breathing shallow. Um, if you're a percussor, I've been called a cusser before, but not a percussor. If you're a percussor, you're going to hear hyperresonance on the lung. And they get fluoritic uh, pain. Here's another chest film, and you can see right here, this is the cute little baby lung that's all shriveled up on the side. And if you were to just look at that and not know anything about chest films, something about that says something's not right. So how do we manage pneumothoraces? We can establish an airway if you need to intubate the patient. If they've got a pneumothorax, start thinking of other issues that could be going on. 
make sure that these patients are on a non-rebreather. They need all the help they can get. Constant assessment of the airway. I know you guys have long transports, so every 15 minutes, please take a look at your patient. Take the sheet off them, look for chest rise, listen to their lung sounds again. Hey, is there anything different now than there was 15 minutes ago? And then chest tube placement. We need to have big fat IVs in these people with, with fluid hanging, and we're gonna monitor for attention. So for, for my job at, at AirMed, we put chest tubes in. And I know that you guys don't put chest tubes in in the field, but it's nice to know how to put a chest tube in because then you're gonna, you'll be one step ahead of the game. And if you're ever in the ER, you can tell the doc, hey, I'll put sterile gloves on and help you. I'd be happy to hand you instruments. The hardest part about putting a chest tube in is just getting your anatomy down. Patients are, are fat, um, especially our elderly women. It's hard to do landmarks on elderly women. So landmarks. For, for men, let's do nipple line. That'll take you right about fourth to fifth intercostal space. For our cute little 80-year-old women, if you did nipple line on them, you'd be putting chest tubes in their bladder. So <laughs> what we're going to do is go mammary crease. And your mammary crease is just on the inferior part of where your breast um, comes out. So that's a great landmark. Another down and dirty way is to stick your hand in your patient's armpit and where your pinky lays is going to be your fourth intercostal space. So we're shooting for fourth to fifth intercostal space. So we're going to clean the site really good. We're going to have sterile gloves on and we are going to cut with a scalpel on top of the fifth rib. And when we cut, we're going to cut down, cut down, cut down. And then we're going to take peens, which are about this big. They look like big fancy hemostats with a curved end on them. And you'll see us hold these peens in a certain way. And what the peen is meant to do is pop through that pleura. So as we pop through the pleura, you're going to hear this amazing noise. It's going to be like, Oh, and the patient may take a deep breath if he's awake, and it's just going to be an explosion of air or blood, so be careful. Once um, we've popped through the pleura, the emergency's over, okay? The air's going to escape, the blood's going to escape. And one thing that I wanted to mention with the ribs, we are going to go, as we go into the pleura, we're going to go up and over the rib. And the reason is, is that on the inferior portion of the rib is where your nerves, arteries, and veins lie. So when we do any um, chest tubes or needle thoracostomies, up and over the rib is how we enter. So once we get into that pleural space, the air gushes out, everybody claps, you get to take a bow. No, not really. Then we are going to um, introduce our chest tube, and our chest tube will be preloaded on another peen, uh, sterile, and our, my partner's going to hand it to me, and um, I have my finger in the pleural space. I'm going to actually just switch my finger out with my chest tube, and then I give my chest tube a nice little twist superiorly, and that's where the chest tube is going to lie. Main thing with the chest tube is to make sure that all the holes that are on this chest tube are actually in the patient. If the hole is outside of the patient, there's a problem. So we need to make sure that it's in. We may suture or we may put um, little towel clamps on the outside of that. We're going to hook it to a pleurovac or a little tiny Heimlich valve, which is like a mini pleurovac. And then we're just going to put some, vas you know, just some gauze on the, on the end of that, tape it up really good so it doesn't move during transport. Chest tubes don't take that long to do. It's actually just like the, the anticipation of doing one. There was a, a call that one of my nurses did out in Tooele, and the patient was awake. They gave the patient some medicine, and he had a, a bad pneumothorax. They put the chest tube in, and he said that even though it did hurt, he said that the relief of pain was worth, he said, I, you can put four of those in me. It was, that it was that much worth it. So if you need a chest tube in the worst way, it actually is, re it's a relief for your patients. So sucking chest wounds. How do you know your patient has a sucking chest wound? Well, hopefully that big hole in their chest is going to give it away, that big nasty noise that, that, that the hole in the chest is making. There is a great animation of this. If you just go on YouTube and do a search for a movie, it's called Three Kings with George Clooney, very easy on the eyes. One of the guys gets a sucking chest wound, and George Clooney actually puts a needle in this patient. I would have shown it today, but there's a lot of F-bombs on there, and I don't want to offend anybody. So if you're so inclined, you can take a look at that video. These wounds can form a one-way valve, which, which is problem, problematic because as your patient takes a deep breath in, great, life is good. But when they go to take a deep breath out, there's really no way for that air to, to escape, and it could cause a tension pneumothorax. If that wound is big on the chest, like our military people that, that are in um, the Middle East that get big wounds, the air is more likely to enter that wound than it is their trachea. So it's really important that we get this taken care of quickly. So the opening in the chest wall is going to tip you off. They're going to be tachycardic. They 
they're going to have respiratory distress. They're going to have sub-Q emphysema into their necks, into their axillas, and obviously decreased lung sounds on that affected side. So cover with an occlusive dressing. And what I mean by occlusive dressing is not just um, a 4x4, four because four, there's a ton of holes in 4x4s. Four we can throw some Vaseline gauze and then some 4x4s four on top of those. We're going to tape it on three sides. In theory, that's meant to let air escape. This patient really needs an operating room. Make sure they have a non-rebreather on. We're going to monitor for attention pneumothorax. Maybe put a chest tube in these people. IV, EKG, and get them out of there. Spending time on scene dinking around with this is not going to help. Some of the medics in the valley are carrying this. I don't know if you guys carry these um, on your trucks or not. Uh, Asherman chest seal. And basically, this is a fancy 4x4 four four with Vaseline gauze on it. This right here is the flutter valve to let air escape. It's great. It's, it's wonderful um, when it works. So tension pneumothorax. This is the fun stuff right here. Air is entering the pleural space as the patient takes a deep breath, and it has no way to get out. This is a life-threatening condition, and if your patient has a tension pneumothorax, it's not time to grab a cup of coffee before we fix it. It's not time to do a chest x-ray so we can get it on a picture. There's plenty of those out there. Your intrapleural pressure is rising. It's actually causing pressure to push on this side. So now your heart's getting compressed. Your superior and inferior vena cava is getting compressed. Your trachea is going to the other side. And then this lung is getting compressed. So it really causes a lot of drama for everybody. So blood can't return to the heart. Decreased venous return. So your cardiac output is, is then going down dramatically. Once the cardiac output falls, the patient starts going into shock. This happens so, so quickly. So you've got to be ready for tension pneumothoraces and be ready to treat them. So signs and symptoms, if you've waited too long, death, um, that would tip you off. Any trauma code that we go on gets automatically bilateral needles in the chest. They obviously are going to get an airway as well. But needle thoracostomies take two seconds, and they're very quick. So if you are working with a trauma code, make sure that you're doing that first and foremost. Subcutaneous emphysema. There was a call um, a couple years ago, and what it was was a guy who came into a hospital and said, I just took a Laura tab. I was in a car accident earlier, and I, I think I'm having an allergic reaction. Well, sure enough, his face is swollen, his lips are swollen, and he is not doing well at all. So they give him Epi, and they give him Benadryl, and they're doing all the everything you should be for a, an allergic reaction. The flight team gets there, and they listen to lung sounds. I'm like, gosh, he just doesn't have any lung sounds on this side. And he starts saying, I am not doing well. His pressure's in the toilet. His heart rate's super high. He had, a he had a tension pneumothorax, which was causing subcutaneous air to make him look like he was having an allergic reaction. So when you have subcutaneous emphysema, it may be a lot, and it may mimic an allergic reaction. So something to think about. So signs and symptoms. These patients look like they're going to die, and if you let them, they will. This is what it looks like on chest film. Like I said, there's enough chest x-rays out there that we don't need to get our own, so we're going to treat it before the chest film. So we, we can see that one side looks much different than the other, so that should tip everybody off that something bad is happening. One thing you'll see is jugular vein distension. Because your superior vena cava, everything's getting squished and it's not able to uh, empty, so everything up here is going to get distended. If they're hypovolemic, let's say they have a pelvic fracture and they've lost three liters into their pelvis, you may not see the JBD. So what do we do with the tension pneumothorax? We're going to decompress the lung, and we're going to talk about that. But make sure you've got oxygen on your patient. Make sure that you've got um, hooked up to a monitor, and then we're going to get them out of there quickly. The one question I get, too, is you get on scene, and your patient's not breathing, and you suspect a tension. What do you do first? Do you needle or do you intubate? And that's why we work in partners, and that's why we have you guys on the scene to help us. So we're going to do it all at the same time. But there's a cool story. One of our nurses that flew in California, they were on scene, and they were intubating the patient. And she said, I don't see anything. I don't see anything. And she said to her partner, hey, can you give me some ELM, so external laryngeal manipulation, just to kind of get the cords in view? And he says, yeah, let me just needle real quick. He needled while she had the blade in the guy's mouth, and immediately that trachea came into view. So if you can pick one, needle first, and then it will make your life a ton easier. So needle thoracostomies are easy as long as you've got good landmarks. Once again, Tawilla. Oh, is Tawilla watching? Do they watch? They don't watch. 
Oh, that's so sad because I'm going to give them props again. The last one that I that was done in the field for me was a guy who fell off a ladder probably a month or two ago. An older guy, they got on scene, his sats were 40 to 50 percent. He was barely breathing, and they didn't have any lung sounds on the one side, and they needled. They did a perfect job, and the guy immediately, <gasps> oh, gosh, still had his bell rung, but it was really, really significant, um, and they did a great, great job. The one thing is getting your landmarks down, which is so hard because patients are bigger and bigger every day I come to work. I transport yeah. big people. That's what's happening. So landmarks on these guys is hard. So here's a couple really cool tricks. So we're going to go midclavicular line. The thing I see is people going too medially because think about your clavicle where it inserts over by your shoulder. It's, it goes further out than you think. So make sure that you're actually midclavicular and not so much medial. Nipple line is a good way to know if you're midclavicular. Once again, our cute little elderly women, nipple line's not a good choice. So we're going to um, kind of come up with <laughs> what we think their nipple line is. As far as second to third intercostal space, feeling intercostal spaces is the best way of doing it. But if you can't feel intercostal spaces because of sub-Q emphysema, because they're too obese, um, angle of Louis sits right on your sternum. That is significant because your second rib will insert right there on your angle of Louis. So that's where your second intercostal um, space would be. So then you can just kind of go lateral, and it's a great way to do landmarks. To be honest with you, most of my patients, because um, most patients we do transport are obese, I just go feel for that angle of Louis right off the bat, and that's my landmark that I use. We are going to be using a three and a quarter inch minimum needle. The gauge, I don't so much care about. It's the length. This is the number one mistake I see. I see patients getting needle decompressed with the IV catheters, and that's not long enough. Um, they've done multiple studies of CT scan imaging to see how big people's chest walls are. Women have thicker chest walls because of the breast tissue. And also, if you've got somebody who's obese, three and a quarter needle may not even be big enough. Sometimes on scenes, we will have to use our pericardial needle, which is five and a quarter, to needle decompress somebody. So when you're doing your needle decompression, make sure you have the correct size needle. Make sure that you're going in the correct area, up and over the rib because of the nerves, arteries, and veins that run on that inferior portion of the rib. And once you go up and over, you're going to take that needle out, leave the catheter in. You may hear a big air whoosh. I don't need any three-way stop cocks or anything. We just we leave ours and we can just you know pat it so it doesn't move. You may need to re-needle. Just because you've needled once doesn't mean you can't re-needle. If you don't have the ability to do chest tubes, sometimes you will have to re-needle. Life-saving procedure that should be done very quickly. So I always carry two in my pocket. Like I said, when I'm on scene with a trauma code, it's the first thing I do. This is totally off the. I had a patient when I was a brand new grad who had a pneumonectomy and uh, they brought him back to the uh, thoracic ICU on a ventilator. He wasn't breathing well and his pressure started uh, dumping and that. Uh, and uh, I got the thoracic resin to come in, I took out one of those steel Parker pens and stabbed him right in the chest and relieved the tension pneumothorax that he had on his good lung. With a pen? With a steel Parker pen, yeah. Well, Katie, he did the yeah, yeah. I, I, was, I was like, why can we go the <laughs> Now you have to sprinkle gentamicin all over that patient. Yeah, yeah the, the pen mark, yeah. Wow, you know, and uh, I don't advocate pen usage, however. <laughs> Carry it in your pocket. That's a great, and you saved his, they saved, you know, his life was saved. did. Wow, that's impressive. So Casey, um, your other location for this could be where you would put a chest tube, right? So your fourth or fifth intercostal space. Yep. And that's where it's done on Pete's patients as well, right? Yep, good, good thought. So if you've got a penetrating a 4 by 4 in the patient's chest, you can go mid-axillary. Uh, mid, um, really good point. You get a point. Keep up with <laughs> no pressure, Janet. <laughs> <laughs> All right, hemothorax. So hemothoraxes are kind of cool, especially to look at them on chest films. So when patients are sitting upright, you can see blood in the chest really easily. The first thing that's going to tip you off is obviously this right here. That's where this is all blood here. Early uh, hemothorax, they'll actually look at this costophrenic angle, which should be on both sides. And when it starts to fill up with fluid, this costophrenic angle gets blunted. And I've seen a lot of our trauma guys will say, hey, we've got a blunted costophrenic angle. We're going to put a chest tube in. 
So the cool thing about hemothoraxes is that if your patient's laying flat on a spinal board, which all of our patients are, and we shoot a chest film, they could have a liter of blood in their chest cavity, and you can't pick it up on a chest x-ray. So something to think about. Each lung can hold about three liters of fluid. Most common chest wall trauma, penetrating trauma, blunt trauma, high incidence in penetrating trauma. So if you've got a knife in the chest, you can assume that they've cut some important stuff on the way in. Signs and symptoms is everything that we've talked about with these people. Narrowing pulse pressure you'll see with hemothoraces more often. Decreased breath sounds on the affected side. If you are a percussor, you'll feel dull because there's a ton of blood in there as you percuss. And collapsed neck veins because their, circula their circulatory volume is diminished because it's sitting in their lung. These patients are short of breath, and like I said, when they're laying flat, you could miss a hemothorax before it actually shows up on chest film. Management for these patients is a chest tube. When you put this chest tube in, be careful. Have your, you know, if you know it's a hemothorax, anytime you're helping with a chest tube, you need to have glasses on, gloves on, a gown on. These can get really, really messy. The chest tube, when it goes in for the hemothorax, can actually help tamponade some of the vessels that may be bleeding. Just because we put a chest tube in a hemothorax doesn't mean we fix the issue. They, um, if they're still bleeding, we'll have to go to the operating room. So cardiovascular trauma. Any patient with chest wall trauma is assumed to have cardiovascular issues until proven otherwise. And more so with patients in shock. Always assume there's something wrong with their heart. So myocardial contusion can look, like an inf um, can look like a myocardial infarction as well. They can have changes on EKGs, their troponins, their CKs can be bumped. They can look like they're in cardiogenic shock. And we talked about with the sternal fractures, it actually gets squished between the vertebral column and the sternum. That's why these patients do not do well. Most common cardiac injury with trauma and the compression of the heart and uh, against the vertebral column. Signs and symptoms, chest wall bruising. These patients will have arrhythmias. Hook them up to a 12 lead and just leave the 12 lead connected and you can just continually reassess. And these patients have pain that's independent of the respiratory cycle. They are just constantly having pain. And their enzymes may be bumped as well. So lots of oxygen, big fat IVs. Make sure that you're keeping the 12 lead hooked up and getting them to a hospital ASAP. All right, Russ, here's your favorite, pericardial tamponades. So rapid accumulation of blood in the pericardial sac. So as you and I sit here, we've got maybe 20 cc's of a, um, a thin lubricant in our pericardial sac that's just meant to be a lubricant. It's just meant to help your heart pump. Whenever you have a rapid accumulation in your pericardial sac, patients do not do well. Now, the opposite of that is patients that get pericardial effusions. Some patients can accumulate over months, and they can have 300 cc's in their pericardial sac. They do okay because it was a slower accumulation. Our trauma patients do not do well. And as Russ mentioned, 5 cc's may be the difference between um, a rhythm and PEA. So your heart gets compressed. It's not pumping effectively. Your venous return is decreased, which is going to mess up your stroke volume. And cardiac output equals stroke volume times heart rate. So if your stroke volume is decreased, then your cardiac output is going to fall. And then these patients go into obstructive shock. Signs and symptoms. Beck's triad. Once again, this is one of those things that's on every single test. In theory, less than half of our patients are going to show us Beck's triad when they have a pericardial tamponade. But we'll go over it just to make sure you guys feel good about yourselves. So hypotension, distended neck veins, and then muffled heart sounds. Heart sounds are one of those things that I have a love-hate relationship. When I can hear them, I love it. I'm like, oh, I listen to the heart tones, and I can hear an S3 or an S4, or I can hear a, um, a friction rub. But when I can't hear anything, I feel like a loser. I'm not great at heart tones. I need to go back to the ICU. So your neck veins may not be distended. If you have other trauma, you may be hypovolemic, so your neck veins may not be distended. People with chest trauma tend to be hypotensive anyhow, and muffled heart sounds are hard to hear. So any signs of decreased cardiac output you're going to see with these patients. They are going to be anxious. They're going to be altered. Their blood pressure is in the toilet. They're short of breath. They get that narrowing pulse pressure. And then pulses paradoxus, 
which your radial pulse is weak or actually disappears when your patient is inhaling. And that's one of those things that I've read. Um, I don't know that I've ever seen that in real life. So this is a pericardial effusion, but you get the idea. Your heart gets big. This patient needs to get it drained. So for us in the field, we're not sticking needles in people's hearts as they're sitting there talking to us, okay? Pericardial synthesis is reserved strictly for uh, patients in PEA. I think in the ER trauma bay, you guys, do you routinely just stick, stick them? Okay. So when they go into PEA and there's a high suspicion, then we'll go ahead and do a pericardial synthesis. Patients that are awake and talking do not need needles in their heart, okay? Now as far as the pericardial synthesis goes, five and a quarter needle, you're going to find the xiphoid process. Just go a little bit to the, as you're, as you're looking at your patient, it's going to be our right, their left, and 30 to 45 degree angle. As you are sticking the needle in, you're going to pull back on your 60 cc syringe with negative pressure. And what that's for is the minute you get into that pericardial sac, you're going to get a flash of blood. Some of these patients, like Russ said, five cc's you'll get back, and the patient goes back into a perfusing rhythm. It is super, super impressive to watch. These patients need a ton of fluid, and the hope is, is that you can get their cardiac output up enough to get them normotensive again. Once you do, if, if let's say your ER doctor has done the pericardial synthesis and that patient needs to be transported, leave that catheter in, because then when the patient goes into a PEA rhythm, you can actually just draw off the fluid. Three-way stopcock on the end, sterile would be great. And they need to go into the OR. Other piece of trivia, you're drawing off the blood. So the blood won't clot. Very good. Right. So that's how you know that um, you're in the pericardial sac versus. In the left ventricle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why we don't do pericardial synthesis on awake patients. <laughs> now, and, and the other side of that is our cardio, our cardiothoracic surgeons. They, that's what they do. If a patient has a pericardial effusion, they're essentially doing a pericardial synthesis on an awake patient. They do them ultrasound guided. They're very good at it. But for our intensive purposes, we wait for our patients to die with a high index of suspicion. So this is actually um, a, a patient two months apart. So here's their first chest film and here's their second. You can see how big that heart is. So our last fun part of chest trauma, diaphragmatic rupture. I've never seen this in practice. Have you guys ever seen this? No, I've never seen it in practice either. And the good, it's good because they're really difficult to diagnose in the field. So maybe I saw it and missed it. Mostly, basically what happens is your diaphragm ruptures, which is why they call it diaphragmatic rupture. Once again, stuff that makes sense. So your diaphragm ruptures, all of your intestines come up into your chest cavity. How would you diagnose this in the field? You would hear bowel sounds in the chest. I don't listen for five minutes over the chest to listen for bowel sounds, but hey, Mostly seen on the left side, and that's because you've got your liver on the right side that's big. Um, some of our livers are bigger than others. But <laughs> if you've got that big liver or small liver on this side, that's actually guarding the diaphragm. So on the left side is where your spleen sits, and it's not as big as your liver. So diminished, diminished air entry, and you'll hear bowel sounds, and you could actually get a medial sinal shift with these patients as well. They're going to be short of breath. They're not going to want to swallow because they've got intestines sitting next to their esophagus, kind of putting pressure on it. They're going to have abdominal pain. They're going to get Kerr's sign, which is that left shoulder pain. Bowel sounds in the chest. Once again, if you're going to listen for five minutes over the chest, more power to you. So you may get ipsilateral lung compression, and all your mediastinal structures are going to be squished over. So management, much like everything else. The one thing with, with diaphragmatic rupture, they say, is if you can get an NG tube in, great. I would contact medical control before I did that, um, just because I'd be nervous. I'm a nervous Nelly when it comes to stuff like this, especially stuff I haven't seen before. So they may say, if it's a long transport, put an NG tube in, or they may say, hey, just leave it and we'll get it um, when you get into the hospital. 
the one thing with these patients and even actually any chest trauma patient, we're going to avoid tr Trendelenburg. I, I'm not a big Trendelenburg fan. I think it really just fools your body into thinking that your blood pressure is good. But reverse Trendelenburg with these patients on the spinal board is great. Grab a D-tank and just put it right under their head, under the spinal board, and it just tips them up a little bit, and it can actually help them get better aeration to their lungs. And in this case, it's going to help not push all that intestine up into their chest cavity. 56 minutes and 53 seconds. Uh, you guys are getting out early. <laughs> so thanks for listening, and I appreciate being here. And thank you for you five. I appreciate, I appreciate you. <laughs> thank you.